So first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me here to this talk and for the opportunity to speak here. And I also would like to thank you all for being here for this last session um, of this meeting. And what I'm going to talk about is our modeling approaches to simulate vegetation dynamics and in particular how we try to improve the models to simulate or include more trait diversity and biodiversity in our vegetation model. And so the main reason why I'm doing that is that I'm interested to understand biome boundaries primarily in savanna ecosystems. So savannas occur across the huge areas in the, tropical er uh, in the tropics. So you can find them in Australia, um, Africa, South America, and also in India. And they really cover large areas, which means that they also uh, serve as livelihood for many people living in these areas. And they also play an important role in terms of global biogeochemical cycles. And that means that if you have climate change or land use change in these systems, that also has strong implications for people living in these areas, but also for, um, yeah, for that biodiversity and also for, for the climate system maybe. And therefore, I'm trying to de develop dynamic vegetation models to really understand what defines the bound boundary of savannas and to which degree is, simulate, uh, is diversity important to maintain or explain these bound boundaries. And another thing which is interesting about savannas is that they occur in quite different spaces in the climate space uh, or in the environmental space. So this here shows where savannas occur in the temp temperature versus mean annual precipitation space. And you can see quite substantial differences between uh, savannas in um, Africa, for example, which are here in blue, be between savannas in uh, Australia, which are in red, and sort of an outlier of savannas in South America, which, are, which occur at much higher precipitation levels. And there are a lot of different explanations or hypotheses how this can be explained, for example, by climate, where this picture shows that climate alone cannot explain all the variability, by animals, herbivores, fire, by soil conditions, but also by the species competition, which is also influenced by the evolutionary history of these systems. And another important aspect explaining savannas may be lateritic soil layers. And as I mentioned, we try to use dynamic vegetation models to, to explore how these different factors influence the bound boundaries of savannas under current conditions, but also under future conditions. And the nice thing about dynamic vegetation models, I mean, they have been uh, discussed already in previous presentations, but what we can do with them is really that we have this mechanistic process-based understanding of ecosystem uh, functioning. So that's what's here denoted as the internal processes. So we simulate ecophysiological processes, we simulate water and carbon cycle, we simulate plant competition. In our model, we also have an individual-based approach, which means that we also simulate plant demography, so reproduction modality of individual plants. All these processes and internal processes are of course influenced by environmental conditions such as CO2, temperature, precipitation, soil conditions, and so forth, so on. Um, but on the other hand, we can also simulate the impacts of disturbances on vegetation dynamics, so fire, herbivory, or other anthropogenic impacts. And all these different factors then in interact in dynamic vegetation models to, to simulate vegetation state under given environmental conditions. But what we did is we started a while ago, a couple of years ago, to simulate, um, or we started off in, in, in Africa, and we were mainly interested in um, simulating the occurrence of savannas. So I don't know why this is the wrong picture now, but it should show the biomes, the simulated biomes and the observed biomes. So we have grass and savanna, uh, deciduous woodlands and evergreen forests. And what we could show in this study um, a few years ago that we could achieve quite good agreement between these different vegetation types. But as I said, unfortunately, this is somehow a wrong picture showing uh, biomass and not the biome type. But what we then tried in the next step, we tried to use this model that was parameterized and designed for African savannas to simulate eucalyptus savannas in northern Australia. And yeah, the, what we essentially found, it found is that it didn't really work. I mean, the model was parameterized for, for Africa, um, but I mean, we had some biomass and we had some savannas, but, but they were all over, though we didn't really we weren't really able to, 
to simulate the distribution of savannas with this ADGVM model that has been parameterized for African savannas. And what we then did is, or what we then did is that we reparameterized the model with African, with or plant traits uh, or characteristics of Afri uh, Australian savannas. And this here is one of one example what we reparameterized. So this here shows data or a comparison of tree architecture of Australian savanna trees and African savanna trees. So the gray ones are Australian trees, the black ones are um, African trees. And what you can see, for example, that if you have a certain stem diameter, um, then the African trees are typically have a higher canopy diameter than the Australian trees. Um, and the Australian trees are typically taller than the, than the African trees. So what we did is we, we used several of these equations that, or different traits like this architecture, specific leaf area, VC max, and so on, and reparameterized our vegetation models, ADGVM, for, for Australian savannas. And we went further to do the model calibration. So we selected some traits that are, or parameters that are very uncertain in our model. And we did some model optimization to, to sort of adjust them to better, to find a better agreement between simulated um, data and observations. And therefore we used these, this um, set of parameters and we did this recalibration with um, eddy flux measurements at two uh, sites in Northern Australia. And what you can see here is that the parameters that we had to change were mainly related to fire models or to, to, the, to the conditions where fire occurs, um, to competition within plants and between plants, and also to the demographic rates, so seed germination rates, mortality rates of trees. But once we did this recalibration or reparameterization, we could find a quite good agreement between the simulated fluxes uh, at the study sites in uh, Northern Australia. So this is how it springs. Um, what you can see here is GPP and respiration. The black line is uh, simulated, gray line is um, modeled um, as data, evapotranspiration, and also here the height structure. So of course it's not perfect, but um, it's reasonably good agreement between the recalibrated DGVM and um, the data sets. And we also benchmarked then the model against other data. So as I said, we calibrated the model for two sites only, and then we ran the model for, for a transect in Northern Australia. So this here shows a comparison between simulated GPP and observed GPP along this transect and between basal areas simulated and uh, observed. And you can see that also along this transit, we now get a much better representation of these um, Australian savanna systems by this recalibration, which really shows that it's important what kind of traits or parameters we use to parameterize our model and how good the model really is to, to simulate or represent these different ecosystems um, on different continents. And this here shows in the biome distribution. So we extended this analysis and also did it for um, South America. And what this model here, sh or what these figures shows is, so the lower panel shows the simulations with the model parameterized for Africa, so the original version of our DGVM applied to all three continents. And the upper panel shows um, newly parameterized model versions for three different continents. So for Africa, it's of course the same, um, but you can see, for example, for Australia here, um, that the agreement between simulated and observed vegetation is now much better. So the colors that are um, important here are this green one and this light red one, because these are the areas where data and model agree. And if you compare this to um, then you can see that the areas where data and model agree is now much higher. So, as I mentioned, it really makes a huge difference how we parameterize our models, and this is another sensitivity that again highlights um, this issue a bit. So what we did here is, the red so we simulated vegetation at two different study sites in the savanna areas and looked at tree biomass. And the red um, distributions here show the simulated biomass distribution if we use fixed traits or a standard parametrization of our vegetation model. And the blue, line blue lines indicate an experiment where we 
used four traits and assembled them randomly from a uniform distribution with the same mean value um, as the default constant value that we have in ADGVM. And what you can see is that it's really a huge difference um, in terms of biomass, but also in terms of variance between different replicate simulation runs. So it really shows that if we use this variability or flexibility in traits, we can get quite different responses um, in our simulated vegetation here in terms of biomass. And this then motivated us to go a, bit, uh, a step further and develop a new DGVM, which is called ADGVM2. And in this model, we really try to include more of this trait variability. And there are essentially three main components that we have in ADGVM2. Though the one is that we have again an individual based approach, so we simulate individual trees in a vegetation stand. And what's new now is in contrast to ADGVM1, so the original version, we now allow each tree to potentially have a unique combination of trade values. So each tree can potentially be unique. The next thing is that we have a whole lot of trade-offs, which I will ex um, show on the next slide. And what is also important about this model or a new aspect of this model, that is we have trade inheritance, mutation and crossover. So trade combinations or strategies that grow well under given environmental conditions can reproduce and pass their trade combinations into the next generation and thereby persist over longer time periods. Whereas or um, trade combinations with a poor performance because, for example, they don't reproduce, um, they are simply filtered out and can't persist in this vegetation stand under the given environmental conditions. And to sort of have some more variability in these trade combinations, we also included mutation, so that's some random fluctuation in trade values from generation to generation and crossover, which is some recombination of trade values of different plants that we have in our vegetation stand. And this here shows or illustrates how ADGVM2 works. So each, we have here a trade space with two traits. Uh, each dot represents one plant. We randomly initialize the model by, by a random community. And then under different, different um, environmental conditions, we can um, end up in different plant communities, so different trade strategies that work under the given environmental condition or the given disturbance regimes. And if we then have, for example, climate change, then we can have a change of this community from this one here to this one. In the model, we don't only have the two, two traits as illustrated here, but we have a whole lot of different traits that are variable than, that are inherited from one generation into the next. And these are here um, uh, illustrated by the red color. So I don't want to mention all of the traits, but for example, we have traits that describe, describe if a plant is evergreen or deciduous, if it's C3 if, or if it's C4. A central trait that we have is P50, um, which is also linked to SLA and wood density, for example. We have traits that describe how carbon is allocated to leaf, stem, roots, um, reproduction, and storage compartments. We also have some traits that describe seed weight and traits that describe plant architecture. So for a given plant biomass, what is the height of the tree? What is the canopy area of the tree? And we also have traits describing rooting depths and the architecture of the roots. So if it's more deep roots or more shallow roots. And we also have a lot of different trade-offs in our model. So some of them, are, or one is, for example, carbon allocation, which is relatively simple. So allocation has to sum to one. So if you allocate more to one compartment to, for example, increase water uptake, you have to reduce carbon allocation to at least one of the other compartments. We have some mechanic trade-offs. So if the stem diameter is too thin, then it just breaks and dies. We have um, the leaf economic spectrum, so relationships between SLA and uh, leaf longevity. And as I already mentioned, we have P50, which is now a very, very, very central trait in our model. So we have really updated and improved the plant hydrology. And it's very much linked to P50 now, which also links to wood density and to SLA. We have this trade-off between evergreen and deciduous. And what is also quite recent development is that we have different growth forms, so particularly trees and shrubs. 
where we assume that the trees are more, uh, or that this is represented by a trade-off between height growth in trees and between more efficient water uptake uh, in the shrubs. And we also have annual and per-annual um, grasses in our model now. And this here is now some first um, example to illustrate what ADGVM2 <coughs> does. And what we did is we randomly initialized the model, as I said, and then we did 2,000 years or 2,000 iterations um, in, the uh, in the presence of fire, and then we suppressed fire. And what you can see here is, um, for example, the red line illustrates the carbon allocation to um, bark, to bark. And what this shows is that it first stabilizes and once fire is suppressed, carbon allocation to bark goes down, which we can explain by, by the protection of bark or by the effect that bark protects plants against fire in ADGVM. But therefore, we have an increase um, in allocation to, um, um, to root biomass, which improves water uptake and has a competitive advantage um, for the trees. And the green one here is wood density, which also increases because in, uh, if we have fire in the model, then tree uh, wood density is typically low, which means that the plants grow rapidly to escape effects of fire. But what's important here is that the model does not only simulate mean values of the community or the trees in this situation, but it's really that changes in the mean value of different traits um, are caused by changes in the relative abundance of, of, of different strategies that we simulate in ADGVM. And that's illustrated on the right hand side. So this here is again wood density and each dot here or each line in this um, graph here represents one tree and um, yeah, you can also read out the wood density of different trees that we have simulated in our community. And what you can see is that on the one hand, we have several strategies that coexist. So that's really emerging from the ecosystem dynamics. So that's not put into the model, but we really have coexisting strategies emerging. And what you can also see is that when, once we suppress fire, you get a change in the relative abundance of these different strategies. So we get more of this yellow strategy with high wood density. And this drives this increase in wood density at the community level. And if we look into more detail uh, in these trade distributions, um, we can also see now different strategies emerging from the vegetation dynamics in the model. So the wood density is again shown here. So you can see really these histograms of different strategies. Um, but you can also see that we have these different strategies. So for example, the, um, the blue strategy starts flushing early in the, in the year. It has shallow roots, it has low wood density, it allocates a lot into reproduction, so this is really a rapidly growing um, plant strategy, whereas the yellow one is more a slow growing strategy. So it, has, it starts flushing leaves later in the growing season, it has deep roots, it has high wood density, and also all the tall trees in our population um, are, well, essentially from this yellow slow growing strategy. So how does this model now help us to understand the boundaries in different savanna systems? And therefore, I want to show a few examples um, how we applied this model. So the first example is that we tried to understand biome boundary in South America, so it's from the Amazon forest into the Cerrados. And the question is here, how do fire, precipitation, and rooting depths interact to, to, to influence this biome boundary? <laughs> What we did is we simulated vegetation with fire, without fire, and also for, with different um, rooting depths. So that's to test the assumption if, for example, if rooting depths or, or, for example, constraints to rooting depths by lateritic soil layers or other processes uh, may influence these biome boundaries. And we do see, of course, a clear response to these different factors. So what you can see here is mean annual precipitation on the x-axis and the probability of savanna occurrence on the y-axis. And in the um, high rainfall areas, we always have fire, uh, forests, 
uh, irrespective of the scenario, but if you go into the more, uh, more arid, drier regions, then we really have huge differences in, in model projections. Though the one observation is that we always have a higher probability for savannas if we have fire in the system, which is exactly what we expect. So fire opens the uh, vegetation uh, and we are in the savanna state. Whereas in the absence of fire, we have um, lower probability for um, savannas. But it also shows that soil depth really makes a huge difference. So if you have shallow soils, only two meters soil depth, then water is more limiting to plants. Um, less water is available for the plants, and that means that the probability of more open savanna systems with a lower tree cover is higher. And we then also looked into the, the rooting depths that are emerging from our vegetation model. And uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the emergent rooting depths that we have if we allow really 10 meter deep, deep soils. And what you can see is that not all trees really go down to the 10 meters and explore the whole um, rooting depth that's available. But that we have in these high rainfall areas, we have more shallow, shallow soils because there's plenty of water, which means it's not necessary to go down to, to root really down to 10 meters, but it's maybe more reasonable to, to grow tall, to have an advantage uh, in light competition. Um, but if we go into these drier areas, um, we have more and more deep roots. So plants aim to go down to, the, to, ha to have access to these deep roots water reservoirs. And what we then did is we looked at the rooting depths that we need to really um, maximize the agreement between simulated vegetation and observed vegetation. And on the right hand side, you can see um, the difference between rooting depths that we have here and the rooting depths that we need to um, maximize this agreement between data and observations. And what it shows that um, there's more or less no change here in these arid areas, uh, in these humid areas or high rainfall areas. But here in um, the savanna areas, Cerrado areas, the model projects that um, we have more shallow soils, um, suggesting that there are really some, or that we need some physical constraints to rooting depths to really explain the bound boundary in these savanna systems. And what we can also do with our model is that we can look at the different, uh, or at trade distributions well, this here are just the two examples, so specific leaf area and the proportion of evergreen trees that the model simulates. And you can see here these uh, yeah, dominance of evergreen trees uh, in the forest areas, dominance of or co-dominance of um, deciduous and evergreen trees in, um, in the savanna areas. And there's also a clear pattern with higher SLA um, in the cerrados and um, lower SLA in the forest areas. And what we are now looking at is um, how do these patterns change in response to climate change? So this here is just one example where we applied the RCP 8.5 scenario, which really assumes um, strong increase in CO2 concentration. And these figures here show how the uh, proportion of deciduous trees and the, the SLA may respond to to these changes in environmental conditions. And we are currently busy with trying to understand why we find these patterns or what's really going on there and to which degree these patterns are explained by CO2 or by climate or by uh, changes in seasonality of environmental conditions. But what it shows that in many of um, the forest areas, we get more deciduous trees, um, maybe because water gets more, more limiting, because we have more trees and higher tree biomasses in these areas, so water con competition is more intense. Um, while we get less um, decid uh, deciduous trees uh, here in the Cerrado areas and a shift to a, maybe a bit more evergreen community. And we also get some associated shifts in specific leaf area. And this here is just to show that we also get, of course, shifts in, um, in, the, in the biomass in, uh, in response to different climate change scenarios. So the, the solid lines here, or we have three different RCP scenarios here, and the solid lines are 
scenarios where we have CO2 elevation and CO2 um, fertilization effects for vegetation and the dashed lines show scenarios where we don't have or we, where we keep CO2 constant at the ambient level and it shows that we have strong responses to the biomass so if we, have, if we assume CO2 increases then we ha also have an increase of the, the biomass in the Amazon areas while we have a decrease in the total biomass in the Amazon if we don't consider um, elevated CO2 in our simulation runs. And the second example that I want to show is to look more into the trade-off between trees and shrubs. As I mentioned, we, we assume um, that the trees in our model um, preferentially do height growth, which is an advantage in, um, in, in dense vegetation states where light is limiting and where light competition is important. Whereas we assume that shrubs are dominant in, um, or can take up water more efficiently. And it's also important to look at shrubs because on the one hand they are an important um, uh, component of many ecosystems around the world. And another important issue is that we are working a lot in South Africa and there in many savanna systems we see now shrub encroachment. So we see an increasing amount of shrubs invading into these savannas and that's attributed to land use or also to CO2. And so we really want to understand what drives the shrub encroachment in these savanna systems. And this is just ongoing work, but it shows that by having this simple trade-off between shrubs and trees in our model, we can really simulate the, the patterns of shrubs in Africa in quite good agreement to, to observation. So this here is data. This is uh, um, the area where we simulate shrubs. Um, and, well, it's not perfect, but um, the boundaries of the shrub-dominated areas are represented quite well by, by ADGVM2 and by having this trade-off in the model. And this also implies that we have quite different architectures in our vegetation. So this here shows architecture or mean architecture of small trees, tall trees and shrubs um, at a savanna site and in, at a forest site where we have um, many small trees and shrubs and only a low number of tall trees in the savanna areas which represents more this open vegetation state, while in the forest sites we have um, a higher number of tall trees and a much lower number um, of, of small trees and shrubs. And what is also quite interesting is that we really get a lot of different um, phenological strategies in, um, across Africa when we have shrubs in our model. So this year, we, so we classified again our vegetation back into plant functional types. And what we find is that we have primarily evergreen trees here in the tropics where we expect them, and for some reasons also here in southern Africa. But if we look into the shrub-dominated environments, um, then we get a quite, quite a mixture between trees and between evergreen tree, uh, shrubs and between deciduous shrubs. And what is also very important to say is that we did different scenarios with fire, without fire, with shrubs, without shrubs. And our um, study suggests that the best agreement between observation or remotely sensed biomass, for example, and simulation is achieved when we have shrubs um, in our model. So if we suppress the shrubs or switch them off, then we have much higher biomass in many of these areas. And the other thing what's interesting is that Having shrubs in our model, of course, also feedbacks to influence um, fire activity. So that's what's shown here on this, uh, on this side. So, for example, in these areas here surrounding the, the rainforest, we get much higher fire activity if we have shrubs and if we have these more open um, landscapes or ecosystems. And the last quick example I want to show is what uh, the, the trade-off between annual and per-annual grasses um, does. So here the, the, the big question was how does grazing influence the community composition in our grasslands? And therefore we conducted simulations along a precipitation gradient um, and we looked at the impacts of grazing on, on vegetation dynamics. And this one here shows, so the blue, 
or the first result is the, or the first thing that we see is that we have higher productivity at the more humid sites, which is of course what we expect. And then productivity goes down if we increase the grazing. So on the right hand side we have increasing grazing intensity. Um, but what's also interesting is that grazing really influences the community composition that we simulate in these grasslands. So under the more arid conditions we typically have a higher proportion of um, annual grasses where we have a higher proportion of per annual grasses in um, the higher rainfall areas. But grazing really shifts this composition um, from per annuals to annuals if we have heavy grazing. And of course it also influences the carrying capacities which is an important point for, for livestock grazing in these regions. And then um, finally it also influences the recovery behavior or, or what this shows is the time that an ecosystem requires to recover um, both biomass and the community composition and that's of course also very much influenced by precipitation and by the vegetation state that we have. So to conclude, um, what we found is that the interactions between tree rooting depths um, and soil profile and fire really seem to be important to explain biome boundaries in savannas in South America. And our study suggests that limitations or constraints to um, soil root to soil rooting depths really play an important role. We, we could show that this trade-off between shrub strategy and tree strategy in terms of height growth versus water uptake can explain the distribution of shrubs across Africa and uh, that diversity in the grass layer modifies our understanding of grazing impacts uh, in savanna rangelands. And what I think that just shows that, that having more diversity and traits in DGBMs can really um, improve our understanding of vegetation dynamics and our understanding of biome boundaries um, in savannas and probably also in other ecosystems. Which also implies that it changes um, projections under future conditions. And the other thing that I think is really important that we need to uh, consider all these different trade-offs and not only leaf economic spectrum which is of course an important component but also these differences in for example life form or carbon allocation schemes or carbon, uh, um, root uh, plant architecture the where they how tall do they grow where do they put their leaves um, so that really makes a huge difference and I think that we really need to include that in our model. Uh, with this I would like to thank you for your attention.